Hi, John Bryan here. I wanted to give an update in the police boot smash dog crawl video if you haven't seen it. Um, it goes something like this. It's up on our channel. I don't what did I do. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. It goes something like that. If you haven't seen that video, check it out or stay tuned and I'll play it. Basically, the big update is here is that yesterday afternoon, we filed a federal civil rights lawsuit in federal court here in the Southern District of West Virginia. All right, so here's the lawsuit that we filed. It, we've already gotten our case number. It's civil action number 5-20-CV-703. And we've been assigned a judge. So it's, it's, um, it's been filed and now it's on its way for service. Basically, we, this is in section 1983 lawsuit with three separate counts. We have count, let's count two. Let's see, count one unlawful search and seizure in violation of the Fourth Amendment. That's for entering the house and committing warrantless searches and seizures therein. Count two, use of excessive force in violation of the Fourth Amendment. That's for beating my client. Count three, bystander liability. So when you have a excessive force situation, a beating, and either the client doesn't know exactly who did the beating or there were multiple, multiple people involved, Federal law allows for, for all of the police officers who are on duty and present to be held liable for it if they observed it and did nothing to stop it. My client, his name is Matt Walkup. His name's real name is James, but he goes by Matt. He was at his home in the western end of Greenbrier County, and it's off of a main road, the main road, uh, Route 60, that goes through that area. And an old friend named Fred Bostick stopped by. Unbeknownst to James, slash Matt, this guy had been on home incarceration and apparently had just cut off his ankle bracelet. Matt didn't know this. Um, his vehicle was in view of passing motorists, including law enforcement. As was inevitable, somebody saw his vehicle there and some state troopers had called a Raynell police department officer who was closer to the scene to meet them at the scene. All the officers met at the scene they knocked on the door. After they knocked on the door, that's when Mr. Bostick said to my client, well, that's probably the police here to arrest me. That's when he told him he had cut off his ankle bracelet. And my client said, um, Fred, go outside. Just go outside. I don't want to be involved in this. But he said, no, I don't want to go outside. Let's just, you know, if, if I don't answer the door, if I don't go out there, they'll go away. And my client said, no, they're not going away. They're going to come in and we're both going to end up going to jail. Just go outside. Now, Apparently, this Bostic guy was a big dude. He was a lot bigger than my client. He wasn't going to make him go outside if he didn't want to go outside. Now, nobody was armed. My client wasn't armed. Mr. Bostic wasn't armed. Just the police are knocking on the door. At some point, it sounds like they get out a bullhorn. So they're not going away. Finally, my client talked uh, Mr. Bostic into going outside. The guy went outside, and it was apparent to my client that he had been taken into custody because he hears them say, get on the ground, get on the ground. And, and they, it was apparent that they had taken him into custody, but they didn't go away. In fact, at that point, they opened the door, made entry to the house and they asked my client to come outside. All right. So this is where he's got his phone on. They're calling for him. That's the front door of his house. The officers are out there on the porch they had already taken the guy they were looking for into custody. They had an arrest warrant. Well, let me stop it real quick. They had an arrest warrant for the guy that they were looking for, some sort of federal arrest warrant, uh, parole violation or something like that. So that guy was already into custody. It had been several minutes before, maybe three to five minutes prior to that. The guy they were actually looking for, they had him. So now they're looking for my client. And there was some question, maybe they confused identities. They thought my client was the guy they were looking for. Um, but here, you can hear when they open the door. And again, they don't have an arrest warrant for my client. They don't have a search warrant for my client's house. The guy they were looking for did not live at this house. Remember, he was on home incarceration and cut off his bracelet. Therefore, they knew he lived somewhere else. 
But listen to what they say when they come in the door. Yo, yo. Come on. I haven't done anything. I don't know what's going on. So they say, hey, Matt. Hey, Matt. So they that's my client's nickname, James Matt Walkup. So they know it's his house. They know who he is. They don't think he's the other guy, Fred Bostick. They know that he's Matt, who there's not an arrest warrant for and who is not under arrest and who is suspected of committing no crime. And that's important in the legal analysis of the situation. So he says, I've, I don't know what's going on. I didn't do anything wrong. They're make, he said, I didn't do anything wrong. They tell him, come on out here, Matt. Shut the fuck up. Crawl on your hands and knees. Come out here. I haven't done anything. Anybody else in here? No, sir. I don't know what's going on. Keep coming. Keep coming. He's saying, I don't know what's going on. There's nobody else in here. And by the way, they're not looking for anybody else. The, the, the guy they were looking for, they already got. So here he, here he comes to the door. And I know the other guy was in custody because I have the 911 recordings where they report that they have they have him in custody. So now they're making Matt crawl to the door. He's just saying, come on, come on, a little closer. I don't what I do. What you know what you're saying, yeah. All right. So then he reaches his hand in the doorway. And as my client's nearing the front door, he grabs him and he pulls him out on the front porch. I'm sorry, I'm sorry sir. I'm so and he stomps him one time, possibly with his boots, hard to tell. He doesn't know the camera's recording. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. No, sir. I'm sorry, sir. If you don't fucking listen, and then he hits him. He says, I'm sorry, sir. He says something to the effect of when I tell you to get that get out, get out, get the fuck out of the goddamn house, you get out of the goddamn house. Something of that nature. What did I do? What I knew, what I do. We'll let you know in just a second. When I tell you to get the fuck out of the goddamn house, get out of the house. Boom. I'm, I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. I didn't mean. Sorry, sir. Please don't kick me again. You hear that? You can hear the handcuffs closing. Hear that? I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't understand. Click. Handcuffs are on right now. Handcuffs behind his back. I don't know what I've done. Oh, 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 my head. There, he strikes him again. He, I believe, boot stomps him at that point. And that's when he does the damage to his head. I can bring that up. Well, I can't bring it up yet. There it is. So there is my client's head directly after this happened. It was bleeding pretty badly. That's the damage that this officer just did to, to his head because he didn't come out of the house when he when he was told to do it. Oh. So now he's in pain saying, ow. And the guy who had kicked them a few times dragged them out of his own house. Now he's looking, he's searching the house. He's inside the house. He's searching the house at this point. And then you'll see another officer come from the left hand or bottom side of the screen. All right, here comes a West Virginia State Trooper. You can tell from the green on his uniform. And he had presumably just watched what had happened. And now he sees what the other guy didn't see. And that's my client's phone that is recording the video of what just occurred. He reaches down, covers up the camera and turns off, turns off the phone. He stops the recording. That state trooper, who is one of the two state troopers who are included in the lawsuit, then keeps the phone in his possession for approximately the next 15 minutes or so that they have my client in custody. And ultimately what he's doing is he goes through the phone to see if he can find anything incriminating, you know, something, presumably communications between the guy they were looking for and my client. Um, But in reality, what he also does is he tries or attempts to delete the video, which was just, which was just shown, tries to delete it. And he in fact did delete it after they left and gave him the phone back. 
the client was able to recover it from the trash bin, I think from the cloud of Google Photos or something of that nature. So the, the video was deleted, but the client just got it back. So they take him into custody. My client is handcuffed face down on the floor of his porch. He's kicked in the back of the head or stomped in the back of the head, causing that injury um, while he's handcuffed face down on his porch. This is the guy that engaged in the use of force. That's as he's doing it. He's a officer with the small town of Raynell Police Department that's in the western end of Greenbrier County. And the guy who grabs the phone is this is this fellow right here. He's a West Virginia State Trooper. And this almost is is I really want to make a meme out of this. There's a couple of good memes that this could be. One is, um, you know, that's a nice video you've got there. It'd be a shame if someone deleted it. Or you could also make it that moment when you realize that your buddy just got videotaped boot stomping an innocent citizen in the back of the head. I don't know. There's a couple of good memes that you could make out of that. But we did file a lawsuit. It's pending. Again, you fought, you sue individuals in these civil rights lawsuits, not their employers. But there's no doubt that their employers will be served with the papers and their lawyers will be defending them. So I've gathered some evidence. Part of what I did was serve Freedom of Information Act requests on both agencies. So both the West Virginia State Police um, and also the Raynell Police Department. The West Virginia State Police returned my FOIA request with the following response, and this is on their letterhead, but basically they said they searched their records. They have no record whatsoever of this incident. So we had no police report from the state police, which is surprising because what are they going to put? Um, I watched um, a Raynell police officer boot stomp this guy, and then I deleted the video for him. Basically, then we apologized and left uh, the end. No, he wasn't going to say that. Um, again, that, those, are, those are my words, not his, obviously. I also sent a Freedom of Information Act request to the town of Raynell to ask them for some documentation of this incident, and they did return a basically one-page sort of deal police report. And this is the narrative. So this is this, is this guy, the one who told him, when I tell you to get the fuck out of the house, you get out of the house, and he stopped him. So this is this guy's report. But this, I mean, this is a uh, very detailed, very detailed report. So Tuesday, March 12th, this officer with the Raynell Police Department responded Blah, 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 blah. This officer did locate the described vehicle and remained in the area in case the vehicle left until the West Virginia State Police could respond. Upon their arrival, this officer was requested to assist in the arrest due to the previous history of the suspect running and being hostile with law enforcement. The troopers also stated that the suspect and the owner of the residence were both suspected of possibly having a gun. Okay, so I was hoping I'd find some evidence of that from the state police. Where does that come from that my client was suspected of possibly having a gun? He wasn't suspected of anything. And there was nothing from the state police in that regard. I also um, sent a FOIA request to the county 911 center. And I got copies of the 911 dispatch report and all the audio from the radio discussions back and forth. And there's no discussions on the radio back and forth of anybody having a gun or being potentially hostile to law enforcement. As far as I can tell, they had no problem taking this guy, Freddie Bostic, into custody. Now, had they wanted to, they could have gotten a search warrant for my client's house. And they had three officers at the scene. They could have had one or two officers watch the scene, make sure the bad guy doesn't leave, the guy they're looking for. And they could obtain a search warrant for the house that said that, you know, they believe that this guy that they had a arrest warrant for was in this residence and he wouldn't come out. Um, they had three more police officers on the way and they were coming from the place where the courthouse is and where the judge is that they would need the warrant signed. So they definitely could have gotten a warrant, but you can tell that it never crossed their mind because they, they never said anything about it in the 911 reports. Here is the, basically the CAD sheet 
where it, it shows where the, where the calls came out. So the, the first call really was they're attempting to serve a warrant. Subject inside was refusing to come out. They called and requested additional units. They were on their way. And then they made a phone call um, or then they called uh, dispatch to request the, the telephone number for the residents. And they even referenced the owner of the house, my client, Matthew Walcott. So they know who, knew whose house it was. You can hear that they know who owns the house. Okay, if you were quick to respond to call sheet for 597, leave a Matthew Walker or something. Get your phone number attached to Okay, so they know who they knew whose house it was. They knew it wasn't the guy that they already had in custody, and they didn't look to obtain a search warrant for his house, and there was no arrest warrant for him. So at that point, they have the guy that they're looking for. Why are they ordering my client to come out of his own house, and they know it's his house? The only way that you can legally do that is to get a search warrant, and here's Supreme Court case law from 1981, and that's United States Supreme Court. Absent consent or exigent circumstances, police may not enter the home of a third person to execute an arrest warrant for a suspect named therein without first obtaining a search warrant. So if they go to Freddie Bostick's house, they have an arrest warrant for him. If they believe that he's inside, they can go inside. But they can't go to Matt Walkoff's house and enter forcibly without consent or exigent circumstances to get a third party that they have an arrest warrant for. They have to get a search warrant for that house. Now, if they were chasing the, the guy and then he ran into a third party's house, that's different. And that would be exigent circumstances. Or if they had consent, for instance, my client opened the door for them, invited them in, then that would be different. You know, they could possibly even claim that they thought maybe there was a hostage situation inside and that's why they came in. But they can't claim that here because they already had the other guy in custody before this happened, before they entered and what you see on the video happens. So that claim really doesn't exist here. I mean, we can see what happened. We can see what happened. They just didn't care. Um, that's what it looks like. So here it is. It's up on the website civilrightslawyer.com, but you can kind of see how these federal lawsuits are written and you have to be pretty specific with them. So I'll walk through basically everything that happened and I included all the allegations based on the evidence that I have so far. So you have all Fourth Amendment violations, unreasonable, which means unlawful search and seizure for entering the home, searching the cell phone, dele deleting the video footage, seizing him as a person, holding him in handcuffs, keeping him and interrogating him in his house for the next 15 or 20 minutes while they deleted the phone. And ultimately they left the house that day. And I don't know that they even apologized, but they just left with the guy they were looking for and took him to jail. And they gave my client his phone back. And of course they had tried to delete the video. That's when he got the footage back. So he was able to recover that video. Make sure you subscribe, um, set up your notifications and follow along for future um, updates on this case. Um, usually these last, if we go all the way to trial, about 12 to 13 months. So pretty quickly as far as civil litigation goes. So I think it'll be, I think this will be a really good case, a really interesting case. And I look forward to litigating it.